Paco, what can you tell me about gravity in Newtonian physics? I'd say, in Newtonian physics, gravity is a force that attracts pieces of matter to one another. It acts at a distance, and its effects are instantaneous. Right, so if the sun were to, I don't know, magically evaporate, then... The planets would instantly spin out of their orbits and fly off into space. Right, but now let's talk about Einstein. In general relativity, gravity isn't a force at all. It's simply the curvature of space-time around objects with mass. So if the sun were to magically evaporate then... The curvature of space-time would change over time, and the course of the planets would be altered accordingly. So it's tempting to say that Einstein had a better theory of gravity than Newton, that it's more accurately describing the real world. But I have to ask, does that really make sense? I don't see why not. Well, Newton's gravity is a force that acts instantaneously and at a distance. Einstein's gravity isn't a force at all. It acts locally, and it can never exceed the speed of light, so it can't change anything instantaneously, like in the example with the sun disappearing. These sound like completely different things, but we're using the same word to describe them both. Is Einstein's theory of gravity really a better theory of gravity than Newton's, or is it something else altogether? I'm guessing maybe we'll find out on today's show. Hey everyone, welcome to You've Got It All Wrong, a philosophy podcast for handsome people like you. I'm Chad Allen. I'm Mark Sanders. And I'm Paco Allen. So what do you guys think? Are Einstein and Newton talking about the same thing? Are they both talking about gravity? On some level, I think they are talking about the same thing. Like they're both trying to describe something that they have both experienced and observed. Which is what? Uh, which is things in the physical world being attracted or pulled towards each other. Right. Like Newton is, you know, uh, the apple falling from the tree on his head, I think, is an apocryphal story. But that's what he's trying to describe is why things fall towards the earth why anything Bird, on the earth fly. doesn't yeah why, <laughs> <laughs> why do birds or this is a singing show now yeah no this is the this is the musical episode oh um i mean i'm trying to look the musical yeah we've already prepped the show for a book spinoff now right. i'm prepping it for a broadway <laughs> musical spinoff um so yeah, like, I mean, Newton's trying to describe why things don't float off of the surface of the Earth and also why celestial bodies behave the way they do in relation to each other. Right. And Einstein's trying to describe the same thing. Now it gets... So uh, on that level, I think, like, they are trying to describe the same thing and they and we use the word gravity to... As the thing that they are trying to describe, they both use that right. as as part of the thing that they are trying to describe. Obviously, Einstein's theories involve more than just gravity, but the reason that this is a, a interesting topic and and why it's a mind bender is because if you look at the definition of gravity or how gravity this is described by Newton and by Einstein, it seems like they're describing two completely different things. Right. And so that's why I, what we really wanted to talk about today was Thomas Kuhn, a philosopher of science, who had a lot to say about this particular conundrum. Because I think what's tempting, it's tempting to say that Einstein has a better theory of gravity than Newton. And that Einstein's sort of like, standing on the shoulders of giants like Newton and like coming up with a better way of describing this phenomenon. I, ironically, it was Newton who first coined the phrase standing on the oh, shoulders really? of giants. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, also, ironically, Newton was four foot two. <laughs> Not a giant at all? Nope. Oh, man. Maybe that's why uh, he's also credited with inventing the cat flap. <laughs> what? <laughs> 
one of the more interesting uh, pieces on his Wikipedia page. Is this a second half of the show topic, or can we get into Newton inventing the cat flap right, <laughs> right now? Let's do it right now. <laughs> well, he, he, uh, among, among other things, he invented the cat flap, but then he also went on... Um, You're talking about like the tiny plastic flap that you install yeah, on your door it, so it your cat can go outside. It wasn't plastic in the, in, the, in the 17th century. But, yeah, um, what was it? Papier-mâché? It, it was maybe more of a, more of a heavy cloth. The, okay. the, the the big mistake he made was uh, after seeing a, a cat and his kittens, he made a big cat flap for the cat and a little one for the kittens. And I realized, and the kittens can use the big one too. So a genius no. in some respects. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it, was this before or after the apple would like hit him on the head I a think thousand it, times? I think it's just a diversion, just something to kill time. Right. In, in, in between optics and becoming the head of the, the royal mint. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> did patents exist back then? Um, on cat flaps? I'm Why on sure. anything? I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, uh, late 17th, early, early 18th. Are there like sweet, like Da Vinci style sketches in a sketchbook oh, of man, Newton's so awesome. of a cat flap? <laughs> Maybe. I, I, I'll have to check it out. He was also um, a, a member of parliament. Um, a member of parliament for uh, dozens of years, and he only uh, was on record of actually saying one thing. Uh, he he stood up once and uh, buy my cat uh, flaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you seen my new cat flaps? Uh, it was. Uh, do it you was... do your cats constantly bother you to go outside? Are you tired of getting up every time your cat wants Members to go out? Members of Parliament, out? I ask you. <laughs> the, the, the record was that he uh, he only he only said one thing in public in Parliament, and, and was that to uh, was to have a, a window closed because there was a draft. So he was obviously very draft sensitive. <laughs> God damn it, guys. So I wanted to talk today about... God damn it, guys, or God damn it, Mark? <laughs> and your extensive knowledge of wa- Isaac Newton. <laughs> I wanted to talk about Thomas Kuhn's 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which he says that uh, he coins a very famous and very controversial and very much abused term in this book i don't know if you'd say abused i would say overused in the business world oh really yeah okay malcolm gladwell owes like the latter half of his career to this guy i think right because thomas kuhn introduced the phrase get rich quick Ab- <laughs> above above the line marketing <laughs> <laughs> paradigm shift and so thomas kuhn used this word to describe or this phrase to describe what happens when we move from one view of the world or one set of scientific theories to another set of scientific theories. And he also says that often, or almost always, those theories are incommensurable with one another. And this is sort of what you guys were hinting at in the open to the show, which is that gravity for Newton really didn't mean the same thing at all uh, as gravity for Einstein, and that they're sort of the same word, but but used to denote two things which are so completely different from each other that they really um, that that there's no way to sort of like say, oh, this is a better theory of gravity than the other theory of gravity because it's like d- just the words being used uh, like to describe two things that are so completely different from each other. And it's mostly because Einstein had to use the, the, the term gravity because he lived, he was born into a Newtonian <clears throat> world and the, the concept was already there. I guess that's one way of looking at it. But what I think the other thing that Thomas Kuhn wanted uh, wanted us to understand is that from his point of view, it's not that Einstein's theory of gravity was sort of like a better or more accurate view of the world. And that, that, that because of that, everyone just sort of like got on board with it. But that rather like how science evolves is that over time, a dominant paradigm will slowly become less and less able to explain certain phenomena. And that new theories will emerge that do a better job of describing those phenomena and that then over time more and more scientists will gravitate so to speak to those new theories Um, but that science doesn't sort of operate in this kind of linear uh, stepwise fashion where we sort of incrementally improve upon 
our knowledge about the world, but rather there are these massive disruptions where one way of seeing the world becomes displaced by another way of seeing the world. And that takes time. It involves social and political changes uh, and is not sort of like just an issue of like everyone waking up one day and saying, oh, yeah, this is a better theory than the other one, um, but that it's a highly fraught and like highly human endeavor. But the way that I think we understand the idea of paradigm shift, and I think the way that, that Kuhn was using that phrase when he coined it was like this like radical and sudden shift from one set of beliefs to another set of beliefs. So even though it like may take a long time for the unanswered questions or the political environment or whatever to build up for that paradigm shift to happen, once it yeah, happens, it it's happens, kind it of happens like happens overnight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Essentially. And everybody switches from right. one set of beliefs well, to it, another set of beliefs. It's kind of this view that like and this like mirrors a prevailing theory in biology and evolution, which is that there isn't this kind of like slow uh, linear rate of change, but that things happen in bursts. And so... Right, like some major environmental pressure or something happens right. that triggers a rapid right. evolution in a species or multiple right. species and that it isn't a millennia long slow process where every day the species is slowly evolving into right. some new form the species are fairly stable for really long periods of time with maybe minor increments in evolution here and there but the major jumps in evolution happen really quickly over a matter of a handful of generations right i mean and like that's actually seen in modern biology like they've like there have been instances where they've taken species and put them in new environments and seen them have major evolutionary shifts in, you know, like three generations. Right. So it's not, yeah, it's not that it, it's not that it takes, it, it once the sort of evidence builds up, then the paradigm shifts quickly. But the idea is that it takes time for a set of observations to build up that show that the prevailing paradigm is not capable of explaining, explaining or pre and explaining or predicting or both both i mean that's a subtle yeah. <laughs> distinction um but that once you get a critical mass of of phenomena that can be explained by the new paradigm and not by the old paradigm then the old one effectively collapses but it's not as you might imagine that sort of Oh, we we found a few things that show that the old paradigm is like no longer has sufficient explanatory power. Um, so hey, like let's switch to the new one. Uh, you know, it's part of what Kuhn argues is that look, like uh, people have invested their scientific careers in a given paradigm, and that uh, you know the amount of evidence that has to accumulate for them to give up all of their projects and you know their entire like body of work like has to be pretty substantial and often he argues that like it only ha like paradigms really only shift like as a result of one generation of scientists um dying you know, yeah basically <laughs> like all the like all the scientists who were committed to a newtonian paradigm of physics like re resisted relativity as a as an explanation for how the world worked because they had invested their careers in a given paradigm and Kuhn talks about this as like being sort of operating science that's done within the prevailing paradigm he calls normal science or like puzzle solving science which is um, people attempting to um, explain phenomena and um, enrich existing theories but within a given paradigm then there are these giant paradigm shifts that happen outside of normal science where we develop a whole new set of theories 
And then that process begins again, where, where quote unquote, normal science happens within the new paradigm. To, to go back to that that point about um, one generation needing to, to die out for before a new theory could be introduced, um, to quote, this is maybe more of a, comes from the, you know, the, the business world, but to quote um, the uh, podcaster and writer Merlin Mann, you can't persuade somebody of a fact whose job it is not to believe that fact. If their job relies on them not believing it, then you won't ever convince them of that. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I can't remember the, the, the guy's name, but um, we, I mentioned him in the, the, the back half of the episode um, in the last episode, the time episode, um, the, the scientist who was talking about kind of a new, a new paradigm for time philosophy. That was one of his gripes about kind of modern science um, is that there are he, – he doesn't feel like there are enough people – working on basically working on paradigm shifts he feels right. like everybody's working on these incremental improvements or incremental refinements on current science theory and no one is looking at like it, it is the does the paradigm even make sense like there's not enough people doing what einstein did you know in terms of taking risks um you know and i that's one of the things that Karl Popper talks about in terms of defining what is science and what is not science is does, does this theory, does this theory take a risk or not? You know? And I, I think that's, I think that's similar to what he was talking about is, or one of his gripes with modern science is that too many people are just tinkering with the small little edges of, of current right. scientific theory. And no one is w looking at whether or not there's a, paradigm shift required it's because you can get funding for incremental improvement right because it's proven <laughs> that there's a there's a fr the, the, there's a phrase in in science when trying to compare two theories or, or two ideas which are um, in in kuhn's um terminology in incommensurable the fact that um uh you, there is no level there's no linear scale to compare two conflicting paradigm shifting ideas the phrase is uh it's not even wrong you can't even put it on a linear scale of being this right or this wrong because it's, it's orthogonal to the the way you're measuring right. one thing. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's so another example that gets um, used a lot to sort of illustrate Kuhn's view of paradigm shift is um, uh, uh, Ptolemy's uh, attempt to explain the patterns that the planets travel in the night sky was that the greek ptolemy or the egyptian ptolemy well i don't know <laughs> no. uh, he, was born in, he was born in greece and he, mo he moved to egypt he, he, I, I believe you were referring to ptolemy the scientist who was actually born in alexandria which is egypt but it's actually a greek colony yeah, the what was my asked. other option? <laughs> yeah. Egyptian. There was an Egyptian royal family of Ptolemies. <laughs> he just happens to have the same name. <laughs> the only reason I mention it is because they're often confused historically that people. Oh, so you were just trying to like <laughs> confuse me? <laughs> I was just trying to. I was just trying to clear it up for the uh, for the <laughs> listeners. Like, oh, the, the Egyptian royal house of Ptolemy. Yeah. had a, yep. a theory about astral. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Karen. <laughs> Does your dad subscribe to the podcast? Because he might be the only person who is confused momentarily about, uh, about multiple who tolerance. Chad was referring to. <laughs> I, now, are we doing a new podcast? I'll stump Chad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you know, when Ptolemy was the Greek Ptolemy was was working on his theories about the celestial bodies, the prevailing paradigm was that the planets orbited the earth so when he looked into the night sky and he observed the planets apparently like moving forward and then moving backward and then moving forward again he his way to explain that was to say that the planets weren't sir, simply like circling the earth but they were sort of so they were doing circles within circles. They Orbits. started doing these yeah. loops yeah. within loops you, and around you, and the you, earth. And you still hear it you know, when you hear about um, people um, talking about your uh, your astrology sign and, and making uh, uh, predictions. They talk about, say, Mars being in retrograde. Right. Literally, they're saying Mars is going backwards right now right. before it starts going forward again. Right. And so what happened was the equations and the and the theories about the loops within loops got increasingly more and more complex as Ptolemy tried to describe the behavior of the planets. So so complex that sometimes other planets would have to pass through the body of the Earth to get to where they needed to right. be. Right. And so, uh, so 
So this seemed like a good explanation at first, but as, again, quote-unquote normal science attempted within the paradigm that the planets orbited the Earth to explain their behavior, it eventually became almost impossible to fully describe that behavior. And then Copernicus came along and said, well, we can solve but this which, problem. Which Copernicus? <laughs> Bob, Bob Copernicus. <laughs> uh, would you like to call Mark's dad? <laughs> Yeah. Why do you is, that think one my, of my, is that one of my lifelines? <laughs> why, why do you think my dad is is uh, has it's a background the only in person, I mean, because the, he's the only person that I can imagine having since he's your dad. Like, what time is it in Australia larger, right now? A large, <laughs> a larger volume of random knowledge packed into his head than you. <laughs> I take that as a compliment. <laughs> you know, so, so that was a paradigm shift, right? The shift from believing that the planets orbited the earth to the belief that the planets and the earth orbited the sun allowed us to explain our observations of the planets in the night sky in a way that was much much cleaner and and had much more explanatory power because ultimately Ptolemy's attempt to describe these loops within loops just became like impossible to fully articulate because it didn't support it didn't describe what was actually happening it's fascinating one of the ways that the historians think in the records that copernicus came to his theory was that there was a a, a well-known uh, shorthand a, a trick that that mathematicians and, and astronomers used in the same way that we have like tricks to help us remember like how many days in each month they uh, you know the you know rhymes or you know counting on your knuckles there's li these little heuristics that we use there was a heuristic at the time that like just this isn't real but guys just pretend that the sun's in the middle and then calculate orbits as if all these plants are going around the sun and then you do the math and you come out with the right answer and then you know that's you know if you just want the answer that's just what you use <laughs> but that's if, not what's really happening that's not really you know, right, really right, we're right, doing right, the circles right. and the circles that math I mean, is a lot harder I, f I feel like there's kind of a there's kind of a same thing between between Newton and Einstein and this is where like I have a I have trouble completely buying into Thomas Kuhn's description of how science progresses is that a lot of and maybe I'm wrong on this but a lot of Newton's mathematical descriptions of how gravity worked were in a large part accurate so on the one hand, he had a relatively accurate description of how gravity worked, but he was based on what we know and believe in the current paradigm of gravity, how it worked or why it worked, he was wrong about. But you, his you, mathematical you, description, his mathematical description of how it worked was right, why it sort worked, of. or what it it's was, like, okay. was wrong. It doesn't have the same explanatory or predict doesn't have the same predictive power that Einstein's theory of relativity has like if you it Newtonian physics is good enough to get you to the moon and back but if you want to formulate really precise predictions about how things will move through space then you general relativity will always give you a more accurate prediction than Newtonian physics yeah that's, that's but what but the math of general relativity is it an evolution of Newtonian well, math, or is it, or is was all of Newtonian math scrapped, and none of that remained? And all, and, and well, I guess that's the, a really good way of framing the question because this sort of traditional view is that science progresses in this linear fashion, and that we're developing like incrementally better theories about how things operate. But Kuhn would say, yeah, we scrapped that. We scrapped it because. It's it's incommensurable to use his word. It's completely different vocabulary and a completely different set of concepts about how the world works. I guess the other question I would have of Thomas Kuhn's description of how the progression of science works is whether or not any of Newton's equations remain you know, like, how do you account for the inspiration of one person's work on the next person's work, right? If Newton hadn't lived and he hadn't come up with... The cat flap. The cat flap, right? <laughs> like, would... Home Depot sell a cat flap. Would Home Depot sell a cat flap? 
would the home shopping network e- exist? Right. No, but like if Newton hadn't existed, if his body of work didn't exist, would Einstein have come up with his idea on gravity? Like if Newton hadn't tried to describe But what I think he Thomas Kuhn's answer is, is like yes, maybe, because the theory of relativity doesn't build on Newtonian mechanics. It's not like an improvement on it or like a sort of an a further development of it. It's almost like Einstein wanted to talk about the fabric of time and gravity was a side effect rather than the thing he was trying to prove. Yeah, it's not like he was like, oh, I'll come up with a better theory of gravity than Newton. Dumbass. The thing that we call gravity in general relativity is not anything like the thing that we call gravity in Newtonian mechanics. Except for the fact that the reason we don't fly off the planet is described in both of those. Except it wasn't described by Newton to a point where we can actually solve for it. The fact that um, if gravity, if you if you look at the... the, the but the, according to Kuhn, like, neither is relativity because at some point that'll be completely thrown away. Right. It's just a like according to, to According world. to Kuhn, like, nothing that we know right now in terms of science is... Gonna last. Gonna last. Like, yeah. it's all gonna be thrown out for some other paradigm. Yes. I just... I don't know. It's like hard for me to imagine human beings getting to where we are today without one thing building on another. Like regardless of whether or not a major theory and a major widespread belief turned out to be wrong, it's I don't understand how those things don't build on each other. Did, did Kuhn's talk about mathematics? Because there's always the statement that there is a way in the abstract sense you can actually prove something if either through set theory or through how whatever systems you have in place that you can if you prove something that i think the um uh, i forget his name uh, uh, professor marcus Sasaito talks about how once you prove something that that will be proven forever that will be a a mathematical uh a fact uh, in the in the closest sense we can get to um uh, that platonic ideal of, of what something is. If I had to guess, I would say there's like an epilogue to an epilogue to an epilogue in like the eighth revision of the structure of scientific revolutions where Thomas Kuhn answers that question. But I think... Did he do more than two? Epilogues? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do you claim to have some knowledge about how many versions um, of the structure I, of scientific I'm, revolutions I thought he. I thought he wrote two. Well, but. he's written a lot about it, obviously, like subsequent to its initial publication. I would say in general, uh, it's it's usually um, interpreted in the context of the natural sciences and not in mm. the context of mathematics. And yeah, because the, the world is messy. But man, like how do you separate mathematics from physics at this point? That's the subject of another podcast. Okay, <laughs> uh, I don't know. What's your what do you mean? Well, like if you can if you can uh, distill a, a physics problem down to mathematics, and you can prove the mathematical um, state of something, isn't it true by definition that you can you can you can reduce irreconcilably a, a, a physical state of the world to a a state of mathematical proof? Well, but you no. Because that's because because that's 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 the nature. Of Shut the, up, Mark. He said no. <laughs> bioinformatics that uh, biologists just take all the data they have about the natural world that, that they're studying, reduce it down to um, yeah, but statistics, so and then they just solve the statistical problem rather than solve solving the biological problem. Right, but that's still contingent upon their observations and right? and their perception of the observations and perceptions of of what they're and the like quote unquote accuracy of their measuring devices. And I mean, there's and the and the and the paradigm, yeah, exactly. in, I mean, in in which they are evaluating that data. Uh, yeah, like yeah. they still have to evaluate that data, and, they and they're to... evaluating that data based on what they believe to be accurate about how the universe yeah. works, which is based on the paradigm they believe yeah. in. They can't get to a hypothesis without a paradigm, right? Well, I mean, that's definitely what Kuhn would say, and I think that, like, that's you know, leaving math and logic aside and going back to Paco's question about, you know, can we imagine sort of our body of knowledge growing without it being incremental? I think that one of the things that Kuhn says that I like that addresses that is if you think about biological evolution, it's not that evolution is advancing towards something, right? It's not that evolution is advancing towards like the best 
species or like yeah, that that's creationism uh, right that's not teleological in any way but but and and he would say the same thing about science it's not like advancing towards a true description of the world it's it, it's moving away from a previous v- paradigm so in the same way that species are not advancing towards some endpoint they're advancing away from previous species the science is not advancing towards some ultimate ultimate truth it's advancing away from previous theories well yeah i mean i guess i would also say evolution in some way feels like it does have a trajectory of what like at uh, you mean like uh, survival better adaptability to a given environment i guess i didn't think about that statement enough before i made it <laughs> which means it's What's time new? <laughs> time for the break <laughs> all right so i can collect my thoughts <laughs> Hey everybody, we hope you're enjoying the show so far. We just wanted to take a minute to thank everyone for listening and ask for a moment of your time to help create a paradigm shift in the history of podcasting. If you enjoy this show and want to continue to hear more of it, the best thing you can do is head over to iTunes and give us a review. And while you're there, you might as well hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Ratings, reviews, and subscriptions are what really determine whether or not we get noticed and give us the best chance of making the show successful. We really appreciate the support, and now back to the show. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about the phrase paradigm shift, which is Thomas Kuhn's biggest legacy uh, and his the, the bane of his existence. Um, and there's a great uh, interview uh, that a writer uh, named John Horgan from Scientific American did with Thomas Kuhn in 1991. God damn it. Uh, were you going to talk about this interview? I talk about All right, this I'll interview. skip to my next thing. <laughs> no, no, no. You talk. I've got because I've got I've got one more thing too. So you talk about this interview, and then I'll talk about my thing. Is after. your other thing about Errol Morris? <sighs> no. <laughs> God, uh-huh. give, okay. give me some of that quality Errol yeah. Morris. <laughs> yeah, because we talked about Errol Morris in another episode, right? Um, okay, let me talk about Errol Morris. On this no, week's no, no, Errol no, no, Morris no, segment, no, because I, because I, I, I think this is interesting. Talk talk about the John Horgan article. Okay, so the John Horgan interview, really. John Horgan interview. Um, so there are a couple of interesting things that come out of that, and I don't know, maybe you have other parts of it that you thought were interesting, but there's a great quote from Kuhn where he says, "Oh, this is my best Thomas Kuhn impersonation," uh, based on John Horgan's description of how he talks. For Christ's sake, if I had my choice of having written the book. Or not having written it, I would choose to have written it. But there have certainly been aspects involving considerable upset about the response to it. Um, was, was Thomas Kuhn secretly Richard Nixon? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, Thomas Kuhn is kind of a Richard Nixon. We, I like, yeah. That's also the same quote that I wrote. Because wrote in down. the interview, he uh, the no. interview is mostly about how Thomas Kuhn is pissed off about how right. his writing has, like, how that book was misinterpreted. Yeah, and, and and how it was portrayed and interpreted as extremely one sided and dogmatic. Yeah, and I think people also took it to its logical extreme, which was to say that um, science is really just sort of like a cultural endeavor and that it was ruled by sort of mob mentality and like whichever paradigm happened to like garner the most support for whatever reason um, would end up becoming the prevailing paradigm. And so a lot of relativists took this theory and ran with it as a way to say that um, science is just sort of like a... Uh, that the prevailing scientific theory of of a time or a place was really just sort of like an artifact of uh, cultural history. Like it was really... science was as much a, a controlled by fads as right. fashion or right. art, which wasn't or... really what Kuhn meant, right? At all, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I I think if 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 the listeners find this topic interesting, I would recommend tracking down that interview because i think even the setup See to that notes. even the setup to that article about where he talks about how hard it was to get thomas kuhn to accept an interview right um is telling in terms of 
how Thomas Kuhn felt his book and his writing and his work had been interpreted by the press and or misinterpreted by the press and and how his opinions and, and his thoughts had been misused to polarize people. Yeah. There's also a great quote, though, where he says that a lot of the success of the book and some of the criticisms are due to its vagueness. <laughs> so I think like he also knew that like there was he had kind of left the work open to interpretation in many ways. The, the original book was only 177 pages, which is tiny for yeah. a, a text like that. Yep, yep. Much like Edmund Gettier, he he like managed to make an entire career out of this one relatively small work. Um, yeah, but he also seemed to have spent. Most of his career refining it and defending it. Yeah, Yeah. and also abandoned one career for another career and kind of ended up, he's sometimes described as a physicist who abandoned his career for philosophy, but he kind of ended up with one foot in both worlds without like a true career in either. It's interesting that he has such a prominent place in both philosophy and in science but spent virtually all of his recognized public career as a philosopher well well, yeah but but also you know like he never went to school for philosophy did he right like it was just kind of one day while he was still in school like studying to get his degree in physics yeah but it's not like physicists are reading this text i mean it's a philosophical text. They I don't know. I think a lot of they, scientists they, do read this text. I think it has huge crossover into into both worlds. And he kind of spent his prominent public career in this limbo in between yeah. physics and philosophy. Like how many philosopher physicists um, do we do we know these days? It's not a like a personally. Career. well so one other person that i think you could probably describe as a philosopher physicist or maybe not a philosopher physicist but at least a philosopher scientist is carl sagan Mm. he's (laughs) one of my all-time top if not number one like science heroes you've uh, you've cosplayed as as him haven't you Uh, well i don't know if you'd call it cosplay <laughs> well let, let's let's look so, at the photo in the show notes and, yeah. and, and check I that mean, out i i dressed up as and posed as carl sagan for a company holiday photo shoot you will have to have another show on a definition of cosplay yeah i don't know I don't if that qualifies that, as yeah. cosplay right um, did, you, did you go to comic con no i didn't then? go to comic con <laughs> i didn't go to an, an event yeah, uh, it was a. Uh, yeah, you didn't go anyways. to a Halloween party. You weren't dressed up in. You were you were out of context of. Uh... Yeah, no. Although I might recycle that costume this October. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> um, kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier on in the show, you know, I was kind of trying to explain how I I felt like there was maybe a, a middle ground between Kuhn's uh, paradigm concept and the evolution of science concept um and i i came across this essay that carl sagan had written and not to make the back half of the show um people doing impressions or are you gonna do an impression of carl sagan i don't think so (laughs) well this quote doesn't have the word billion in it so it's hard (laughs) it's not as fun to do it when (laughs) when it doesn't say that but i just wanted to read this this quote and, and you guys can can track down this essay mark will put it in the show notes He says, it seems to me what is called for is an exquisite balance between two conflicting needs, the most skeptical scrutiny of all hypotheses that are served up to us, and at the same time, a great openness to new ideas. Obviously, these two modes of thought are in some tension, but if you are able to exercise only one of these modes, whichever one it is, you are in deep trouble. (laughs) And it goes on, like most of Carl Sagan's thoughts and essays and monologues to be like one of the most powerful moving things you'll read on any on that specific subject but he very much argues for this idea of he very much advocates for this kind of balance between evolutionary science and paradigm shifts do you think that's how science is is treated today you think there's a there's an opportunity for people to realize they 
they need to rethink their entire careers. It feels like there's. there's it feels Are you like, asking me a personal question? <laughs> just, I, I don't. I don't. I don't see as much Sagan, Sagan Saganity out there. <laughs> Not a word. <laughs> I don't know. I like it. It's got a little bit of insanity, but Saganity and, and, hum, and humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I think the world could do with more Saganity. <laughs> Not to be confused with sagacity. <laughs> Uh, I don't. What was your original question on that topic? It feels like there's there's less there's less scientists and there's lot there's less uh, thinkers out there who uh, explore different pathways and uh, more yeah. I mean, to... this is like the third time this idea has come up in this episode. The idea that like not enough people are interested in paradigm shifts, right? Right. That it, not enough people are even looking for or exploring or thinking of the fact that there could be a paradigm shift so there's in, an Ameri- in, in their specific there's an american study. philosopher named uh, larry lawden who was a critic of kuhn but who also um advocated for sort of like a, a i guess kind of like a middle path which was that um he, he said that you should accept uh the theory or the paradigm that has to date solved the most puzzles so this is very much like Kuhn's vocabulary of like normal science being about solving puzzles. So, uh, so Laden says you should accept the theory that solved the most puzzles to date, but you should pursue the theory that solved the most new puzzles so that it's possible to sort of operate within the existing paradigm and accept it as the best model for solving existing puzzles. But you should also be on the lookout for, theories that solve new puzzles that had that that arise yeah no i mean i think that's very saganistic what did you say Mark? <laughs> <Saganity. laughs> yeah. larry laudman probably yeah. be sad to hear that you, that you're not calling it laudanistic <laughs> okay i just wanted to say one more quick thing about errol morris who we talked about in the episode about edmund gettier but he just randomly came up again in my research Um, for this episode because he was a student of Thomas Kuhn's uh, at Princeton. And uh, so I didn't know this, but Errol Morris uh, studied the history of science um, as a graduate student, and then he ended up um, obviously becoming a filmmaker. Um, But he has this story that he actually tells in a long op-ed, multi-part op-ed piece for the New York Times, um, in which he claims that Thomas Kuhn threw an ashtray at his head when he was a student <laughs> at Princeton um, because he sort of... Uh, Errol Morris basically thinks that Thomas Kuhn is is full of bullshit. Um, and, yeah, and he has this long piece in the New York Times about it, which is an interesting read, but I also just like the picture of Thomas Kuhn lobbing an ashtray at Errol Morris for disagreeing with him. You don't see, show notes. You don't see uh, as much of that as of, of having Ashtray like large, lobby. heavy ashtrays <laughs> just lying around waiting to by go. your by your professors. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. He said that Thomas Kuhn chain smoked, like that he never actually saw Thomas Kuhn with a lighter because he would just like light one cigarette from the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's the definition of chain smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I wanted to quickly add some uh, some color around the idea of of science as an invention uh, and and the process of uh, of thought. The the quote was um, I think um, uh, Needham, uh, the author of the Needham question, when it came to um, discussing why um, we didn't have uh, the Enlightenment in China that had uh, a lot richer history of uh, miraculous inventions from the printing press to to the gunpowder. He was saying that they didn't have the enlightenment, and when once you have science, you can invent everything else. And the idea of of science as a a, a thinking tool, and there's studies to show that the reason why in Europe we had the enlightenment, we had scientific methods, and we had you know the whole Bacon revolution of being able to justifiably record and produce mm, results. Bacon revolution. <laughs> Was, yeah, I thought the Bacon Revolution happened in Brooklyn in like 2012. <laughs> uh, so uh, with, with bacon ice cream? Yeah, well, no, <laughs> with, uh, bacon everything. I think at one point they were like bes- bespoke uh, bacon uh, bi- bicycles being crafted in Brooklyn. F- fixie, yeah, fixie bacon, fixie bacon, bacon bespoke bicycle. bicycles <laughs> in Brooklyn. 
so so the reason why we invented uh, science was because we had the tools to enable us to make um, accurate objective uh, experimentations and that was due to the fact of the advent of the huge revolution in uh, the 17th and 18th century in glassware production uh, so now you could have uh, scientific utensils such as beakers and uh, uh, test tubes, which are unreactive. And we had the advent of glasses that could be made uh, that could give extra um, uh, eyesight and uh, magnifying glasses, magnifying glasses, and telescopes, and telescopes. And, yeah. all, all due to the fact that there was there was such a, a demand in the in in Europe for um, strong, reliable uh, glass for the production of beer and alcohol that you never had. Uh, elsewhere, so the production of of high quality uh, glassware in industrial facilities gave rise to the scientific revolution. I mean, I think that, that definitely you see things like that 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 seem to cause uh, spikes in scientific advancement. But I I also feel like if you're a parent and you have a kid. I feel like you see the scientific method and the human need to test and learn on a daily basis. I mean, I kind of feel like the scientific method is not something that was invented at some point in human history, but just a codification of natural impulses let me try this let me hum- try this yeah let me exactly try this. Yeah. right the, like, there's, there's record of the scientific method actually in the bible when the god came to daniel and said like i'm god do this thing and daniel said like you know prove prove, prove to me something and he put down this rug on, on next to his bed and uh, he said like you know make, make you know bring the dew to my to the ground but don't make the the rug wet and 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 he, and he made it, the God made it so, and God says, "See, you believe me now." So, okay, now tonight. Wait, so like all the ground got wet, wet except but, for the but, rug, and then he said the next night, make I the think of like make, seventeen other explanations. Make, for that, made but. the made the rug wet, but don't leave any dew anywhere else on on the ground. So yeah, he was okay. doing a, a control test with God. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, and and I mean, honestly, I think you can probably even go further and look at examples of other animals that we would say don't have the same level of consciousness or at least intelligence that we have doing test and control experiments on their environment. I just feel like the scientific method is somehow a codification of uh, an organism's natural behavior to understand and adapt to and manipulate and survive and succeed in its environment but um, it all, all depends that the scope that those um, activities can exist in based on whether newton or uh, einstein was uh, a, a more accurate representation representation of how we spe- see gravity there's the the quote that um all all laws are local and they're all laws don't know how local they are the fact that <laughs> The fact yeah. that, you know, going back to the idea of, yeah, I of, mean, the, the, of a heliocentric world, you can look at the sun rising and that it could be objective proof that we as a body are moving around the sun or the sun is moving around us. It's the same sense data, the same experimental data, data that we're looking at with two different yeah, filters. The data set that Einstein was working with was radically different than the data set that Newton was working with. Yeah, because they had different instruments. They had different observations. Yeah, sure, sure. Even even when we we thought that the the world was was flat, all sailors knew that it was round by because of the fact that you could go up a mast and see further than if you're on 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 sea level. Well, and the fact that like once you got into out into the ocean open, you could fucking see the curvature of the earth. Right, there's yeah. that too. Right, <laughs> like I mean, I mean, yeah, uh, the data the the data and the observations existed at that point to come to the conclusion that the earth was round but to coon's point yeah. the paradigm that it was flat kind of dictated to most people that you ignored the fact that you if you held up a flat board to the horizon right that the earth yeah. curved yeah. away from it the, the fact that the the flat earth society which we think as being you know a pre-scientific uh, organization was only founded in the 19th century uh it, it's a relatively newly isn't that like a joke thing 
No, it's it's well, it was actually it was refounded in 1956. Um, uh, so there, there's people that have a need to want to believe in something despite scientific rationale. There's a great article in the Scientific American, which I think has one of the best titles ever. It's Are we getting money from them this episode <laughs> or what? This episode sponsored by Scientific American. <laughs> the, the title was uh, "The Science: Why We Don't Believe in Science." which has some uh, amazing uh, examples there. I, I, I like everyone to go and read that. <laughs> my, so um, I think we follow should, my uh, affiliate we, link. We, we need to close this out. Um, I'm going to read a last co- quote from Thomas Kuhn, which I think is a fitting end to this episode, um, and also an interesting observation, again, on his part about science. He says, there was a beginning to it, meaning science. There are lots of societies that don't have it, it takes very special conditions to support it. Those social conditions are now getting harder to find. Of course, science could end. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that wraps it up for this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and give us a rating in iTunes. As always, you can find us online at you've got it all wrong.net. And you can find show notes for today's episode there. You can also send us an email at feedback at you've got it all wrong.net with questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics. And you can also follow us on Twitter. I'm at Chad Allen. I'm at M. Sanders. And I'm at Paco Allen. Did you know that um, Karl Popper was the inventor of the jalapeno popper? <laughs> <laughs> Can you give a citation for that? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's in the it's in the, the last show notes. No, it's the last page of the TGI Fridays menu. Uh. Chad Bumper Allen. Uh, well, oh, hold on, just I mean, give some fucking time for me to do some sound, <laughs> some noise cancellation. Mark's looking at my finger over here on the mouse. (laughs) Yeah. No. As soon as you heard the click of the mouse, you're like, blah, I'm a vampire. (laughs) (laughs) One, two. (laughs) Articles to reference. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Who's doing the monologue? Monologue. 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 I heard they had a great monologue in Shelbyville. Paco, what can you tell me about gravity in Newtonian physics? I'd say in Newtonian physics, gravity is all about... Fucking goddamn it. That's what I'd have to say about Newtonian (laughs) physics. Are we recording the show right now, or are we just doing the show without recording it? Um, Well, we're actually recording this, but... I'm recording it so that when Mark says something racist, I can put it at the end of the show.